Beneath the waves lies Earth's last frontier, the deep ocean, a world of crushing pressures, freezing temperatures and total darkness, where strange life forms exist beyond imagination. For centuries it remained beyond human reach. That is until 1960, when the bathyscaphe Trieste proved otherwise, descending nearly 11,000 meters down to the deepest point on Earth. In this video we've modeled the Trieste inside and out to reveal the engineering that made the first crew dive to the ocean's deepest point. I'm Lion and this is Deconstructed. We break down the engineering behind history's most fascinating and today's most advanced machines and structures. So let's see how it works. Before we can understand how the Trieste conquered the abyss, we first need to see what it was up against. So let's dive from the shoreline to the bottom of the deepest trench and watch how humans slowly push deeper with each breakthrough. The journey begins at sea level. Just below the surface, the seafloor stretches out into the continental shelf, the shallow zone where humans learned to dive. Early free divers could reach a depth of about 30 meters here, descending with nothing but the air they carried in their lungs to gather food and resources. By the early 20th century, hardhead diving suits pushed this limit further, with heavy copper helmets and air pumped down from the surface reaching depths of nearly 100 meters, a remarkable step, though it's still shallow compared to what lay ahead. At around 200 meters, light begins to fade, and the ocean floor drops away from the continental slope. This marks the start of the twilight zone, where sunlight weakens rapidly with depth. Even today, modern military submarines rarely venture beyond a few hundred meters. In 1934, humans reached a new milestone, descending to a depth of 923 meters in the bathysphere, a spherical, unpowered deep-sea submersible lowered into the ocean by cable from a surface ship. By 1,000 meters, we enter the midnight zone, where sunlight disappears entirely and darkness becomes absolute. Then, at 2,250 meters, the sperm whale, one of the deepest diving mammals, reaches its limit. Here, the pressure is immense, around 25 megapascal, or 250 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level, which is like the weight of an off-road vehicle pressing on an area the size of a postage stamp. Descending further, the slope levels out into the continental rise, between 3,000 and 4,000 meters down. It was here in 1953 that the newly built Trieste broke its first world record, after becoming the first manned vessel to reach 3,150 meters. At 3,800 meters lies the wreck of the Titanic, resting on the floor of the North Atlantic. Beyond 4,000 meters lies the abyssal plain, a vast, flat sea floor stretching between 4,000 and 6,000 meters deep. Life is sparse here, where darkness is total and pressure is crushing. Then, the seafloor plunges into the oceanic trenches, the deepest parts of the planet. Around 8,849 meters, you could invert Mount Everest and its peak would still be nearly 2 kilometers from the deepest ocean trench. By around 10,000 meters, you've reached the cruising altitude of a commercial airliner. At last, we arrive at the deepest known point in Earth's oceans, Challenger Deep, which lies 10,984 meters down. Here, pressure exceeds a staggering 100 megapascal, like the weight of a semi-truck pressing on an area the size of a postage stamp. First identified in 1875 by the British Royal Navy survey ship HMS Challenger, it is located in the Western Pacific Ocean at the southern end of the Mariana Trench, named after the nearby Mariana Islands. On January 23, 1960, the Trieste, which had been modified after the record-breaking 1953 dive, became the first vessel to reach this point, carrying oceanographer Jacques Picard and U.S. Navy Lieutenant Don Walsh on a descent that lasted 4 hours and 47 minutes to a depth of 10,916 meters. This record-holding manned deep-sea dive stood unchallenged for nearly 60 years, and even today, only a few dozen people have ever reached the deepest place on Earth. All of it leads to a single question. 
How was the vessel built to endure the crushing depths of the ocean? The answer lies in the design and engineering of the Trieste. Before we dive deeper, we created this poster to go along with this video, and we're giving one away. To enter, just like the video, subscribe, and comment below. What surprised you the most about the Trieste? We'll announce the winner in the next upload. And if you'd like to grab one now, the link is in the description. The Trieste itself was a special kind of deep-sea submersible called a bathyscaphe. The name comes from ancient Greek, meaning deep ship, a free-diving vessel able to move on its own instead of hanging from a surface cable like the bathysphere mentioned earlier in this video. Submersibles like the bathyscaphe still depended on a support ship for launch and recovery though, unlike submarines which are completely independent vessels. Its design paired two key elements. Beneath a massive buoyant float hung the pressure sphere, or the crew's cabin. Spherical geometry spreads external pressure evenly, and the shape makes the sphere the safest possible enclosure when facing the crushing forces of the deep. The bathyscaphe's float was packed with aviation gasoline, chosen because it's lighter than water and only slightly compressible even under extreme pressure. This gave the craft the buoyancy it needed to rise back to the surface after the dive. The entire design worked on the principle of a free balloon in air. The float acted like the gas bag, while the pressure sphere below served as the gondola carrying the crew. Bathyscaphes were first invented in the late 1930s by Swiss physicist August Picard, who had previously pioneered high-altitude balloon flights before turning his attention to the ocean's depths. Years later, his son Jacques Picard would pilot the Trieste and break deepest dive records. Only four bathyscaphes were ever built, each capable of diving several thousand meters. Trieste was the second of these designs, named after the Italian city where it was constructed. Later purchased and modified by the US Navy, it became the first vessel that ultimately carried humans to the planet's deepest known point, the Challenger Deep. As we take a closer look at the engineering of the Trieste itself, it's important to understand some basics for orientation. Like surface ships, submersibles use standard nautical directions, forward for the front, aft for the back, port for the left side, and starboard for the right. The Trieste measured 18.1 meters long and 3.5 meters wide, weighing 50.8 metric tons empty, about the weight of a large bulldozer, and 152 metric tons when filled with gasoline. Too heavy for most ships to lift, the Trieste was towed to its dive site, a decision that influenced the streamlined shape of its float. The pressure sphere of the Trieste was a forged steel cabin 2.16 meters in diameter, with 130 millimeter thick walls, strong enough to endure extreme pressure. By itself, the pressure sphere weighted a massive 14.5 metric tons, which is about the weight of a city bus. Access to the pressure sphere was through a hatch, Inside, the compact cabin provided a very small space for two people, along with the life support, control, and navigation equipment needed for the dive. For outside observation, the sphere was fitted with two small viewports, the primary forward viewport and an additional one in the rear. Each measured only about 100 millimeters in diameter and were made from a single, tapered block of acrylic glass the only transparent material strong enough to withstand the immense pressure of the deep ocean. Mounted on the float were the key components that allowed the Trias to descend, maneuver, and safely touch down on the sea floor. At the stern sat the fixed rudder, providing stability while the vessel was being towed across the surface. Next to it hung the guide rope, a 24-meter steel cable suspended beneath the float. This line reduced lateral drift during descent and absorbed part of the impact when the submersible made contact with the seabed, ensuring a softer landing. Clusters of external floodlights were also mounted under the float, ready to illuminate the bottom during approach and observation. Most critical of all were the ballast hoppers, two conical tubs recessed at the bottom of the float one forward and one aft of the pressure sphere. Each held about 8 tons of iron shot, the weight that enabled the Trieste to sink. To return to the surface, this shot had to be released. 
The iron shot was secured by electromagnets arranged around a funnel-shaped orifice at the base of each hopper. When energized, the magnets kept the shot firmly in place. When the circuit was switched off, or if power failed, the magnets lost their hold and the shot flowed freely, lightening the craft and starting the ascent. Because pressure at extreme depths made the submarine method of blowing water out of tanks with compressed air very impractical, this magnet-released iron ballast system was essential to controlling buoyancy. Mounted above the float were other systems that kept the Trieste safe and maneuverable during its dive. Three electromagnet release assemblies held the ballast tubs and the guide rope in place. Each tub was attached to a chain running through the float and connected to one end of a pivoting arm, the other end secured by an electromagnet. In an emergency or power failure, the magnets could be released, causing the arm to pivot and drop the chain. Instantly jettisoning the tubs, the guide rope could be released the same way. At the surface, the arms could be locked firmly in position with a pin and a turnbuckle to prevent accidental release. The Trieste was equipped with two small, low-speed horizontal electric propellers, mounted ports and starboard. These allowed careful short-range maneuvering once the submersible reached its target depth. Completing the upper structure was the Cunning Tower, a sturdy framework rising above the float. This tower provided the only access to the pressure sphere below, serving as the entry and exit point for the crew. Inside the float was a carefully arranged network of compartments and a passageway. Crew members entered the pressure sphere through an entrance tube, or antechamber, fitted with a ladder that ran from the conning tower down through the float. The tube ended in an elbow joint connected directly to the sphere. During a dive, this entire passage flooded completely. At the back of the elbow set a curved acrylic window, allowing a clear view through the sphere's rear viewport to check the aft ballast tub and its light. The float itself was divided into 14 compartments. At each end were two water ballast tanks, which provided the negative buoyancy needed to begin descent. The remaining 12 compartments were buoyancy tanks, all filled with about 130,000 liters of aviation gasoline. Now let's take a closer look at how the Trieste operated during a dive. The crew first entered the pressure sphere through the top entrance tube and sealed the hatch. To begin the descent, the end ballast tanks and the entrance tube were flooded with seawater, creating the negative buoyancy needed to begin sinking. As the submergible descended, a spring-loaded two-way breathing valve on the float opened inward, allowing seawater to enter the gasoline tank and equalize the pressure inside the float. This step was crucial because gasoline is slightly more compressible than water. The float needed pressure compensation to keep it from being crushed as the gasoline compacted. The denser seawater settled to the bottom of the float while the gasoline compressed above it. With increasing depth, the gasoline's volume and therefore buoyancy gradually decreased. To maintain a steady descent, small amounts of iron shot were released from the ballast hoppers ensuring a controlled sink rate. After a few hours of descent, the vessel approached the seafloor, and external floodlights were switched on to guide navigation and observation. The guide rope touched bottom first, taking some of the impact and helping to stabilize the vessel before the pressure sphere settled gently onto the ocean floor. When the mission at depth was complete, more iron shot was released to start the ascent. As the Trieste rose, the expanding gasoline forced seawater back out through the breathing valve, accelerating climb automatically. Once back at the surface, compressed air was used to blow the water out of the entrance tube before opening the hatch. Later, the support ship supplied air to blow out the ballast water tanks, resetting the system for the next dive. By the late 1960s, a new generation of deep-sea submersibles began to take over. Smaller and more agile than the Trieste, these craft abandoned the bulky gasoline float in favor of pressure-resistant buoyancy materials such as syntactic foam. Designs like DSV Alvin set the template, compact, maneuverable, and equipped with robotic arms and specialized instruments for scientific sampling. Exploration kept pushing forward. On March 26, 2012, film director James Cameron piloted the Deep Sea Challenger to the Challenger Deep, 
only the second crewed mission thereafter the Trieste 1960 dive and the first solo descent. Though its maximum depth of 10,908 meters was just shy of Trieste's record, the craft was dramatically different. Less than one-tenth of the Trieste's weight, 11.8 metric tons, only 7.3 meters long, yet carrying far more cameras, scientific instruments, and capable of a much faster ascent and descent. Since then, several other crude dives have followed, continuing the exploration of the world's deepest point. These advances mark how far deep ocean engineering has come since the Trieste first touched the bottom of the world's oceans, and how that pioneering dive made today's discoveries possible. Quick shout out to our last giveaway winner. Congratulations. And a quick thank you to our Patreon and YouTube members. You'll be getting this exclusive desktop background inspired by today's video. Thanks for watching. Stay curious.